Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So the recording has started. Um, today's class, we're going to cover sections 5.5 and 6.2, um, which is kind of exciting because those are probably the most interesting part of this class, really. Um, we're going to learn what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. So sort of everything that we've been doing up until now has been in service of understanding what we're going to learn today. So we finally got into like the real meat and potatoes of, uh, I mean, we've been on meat and potatoes for a while, but this is like the most flashy result that we're going to learn. Um, so some housekeeping stuff. Um, office hours today from 3 to 4.30 as usual. The SI sessions are in a different place. Just look at the announcement on Blackboard if you need to find it. Um, there is a homework that I posted for sections 5.3 and 5.4, um, which is going to be due on April 19th, which is Tuesday of next week. And on the same day, we're going to have a quiz on sections 5.2 to 5.4. Okay, so it would be good to do that homework probably before we have the quiz so you're pre extra prepared. Um, but what I would really recommend is, this is our last quiz, so if you would really like to bring your quiz average up a little bit, okay, then just come to office hours today or go to the SI sessions or go to the Math Tutoring Center or something and we can study each and all of the extra problems from section 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4, and you'll be completely prepared for the one question which is on the quiz, which is going to be drawn from those extra problems. So that would be a fantastic way to raise your quiz, at, quiz average a little bit uh, if, you, if you're trying to do that, because the quizzes are worth 25% of your grade. So if you can bump your quiz average up from like a you know, 25 out of 40 to like a 30 out of 40, that's going to be like a pretty big boost in terms of your grade. So quizzes are make up a big portion of your grade, so I'd recommend trying extra hard for the last one. Uh, and speaking of quizzes, there's a couple other uh, things I want to talk about. So first of all, I updated the quiz average in Blackboard to reflect what your grade will be after the lowest two get dropped. So the way that the new quiz average is calculated in Blackboard is it's taking your quiz one, two, three, four, and six, and it's taking the average of your best scores with the two lowest scores being dropped. Okay, so that's raised everyone's weighted total quite a bit. Um, and I did that for the following reasons. First of all, I've had some people in my anonymous feedback who, well, let's just say that the tone of the anonymous feedback is that of despair. And <laughs> I don't want my class to cause anyone despair. Um, so I've, I've updated this to reflect your grade a little bit more closely. Uh, what it still doesn't reflect is the homework drops. So don't forget there's also going to be a drop of your two lowest homework scores. Okay, So your homework average, which is in Blackboard, is probably a little bit lower than it actually is. Um, but Wiley Plus doesn't let me do that drop thing, so I'm going to have to do it manually at the end of the semester. But if you want to get a good idea of what grade you need to get on the final exam, here's how you can do it. Okay, You can go to Blackboard and look at your weighted total column. Okay, That's basically a good idea of where you're at in the class right now. So what you can do is take that score and multiply it times 0.75, okay? And whatever you get on the final, you're going to multiply times 0.25, and then that's going to be how your final grade is calculated. So if you want to find what you need to get on the final to get the grade you want, you just put the grade you want on the right-hand side, you put your weighted total score in here, and you solve for x. Okay, and that'll give you your score that you need on the final exam. Okay, so if you have trouble doing this, just come to office hours or email me or something and we can figure it out together. But for example, okay, if I have an 80% in the class right now and I want to get a, at least a C, then I'd do 80 times 0.75 plus 0.25x equals 70. That's the grade I want. And then I just solve for x. And if I do that, I see that I need a 40% on the final in order to guarantee that I get a 70 in the class. 
Okay, so this is just how you can figure out what you need to uh, make on the final to get the grade that you want. Okay, and uh, to further alleviate your concern, I'm implementing the following policy. I will allow each student in the class to retake one quiz of their choosing. So if there was one quiz that you didn't do too well on, you want to retake it, then I will allow you to retake that quiz with the exception of quiz five. So say you did poorly on quiz three, uh, you can go home, study up on quiz three, learn the problem, find your mistakes, see what you did wrong, and come back to class 15 minutes early next week on Tuesday or Thursday and take that quiz. And since you, you know, have studied the actual problem, you know exactly what problem is going to be on it, right? So then you can hopefully do better on that quiz. Does that make people happy? Yeah? What's up, Christian? Would it be like a replace the grade, or would it be like the best? It's like saying I mess up and did worse on the retake. Yeah, I won't allow it to harm your grade. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It'll just replace your grade on that quiz, yeah. So what I will do is, I've got like a bunch of extra quizzes here, right? So what I would do is, say you did badly on quiz six, you'd come into, you would study quiz six and then come in 15 minutes early and then I would hand you a new copy of quiz six, which is exactly the same as the one that you took last time. And then you would be able to take it, but with the foreknowledge of what was gonna be on it and improve your quiz score that way. Are there any questions on that? What if you tell you a quiz ahead of time? Um, no, I'll bring copies of all the quizzes. Um, and if you've misplaced your, um, your copy of the previous quizzes, I'll also post all the quizzes to Blackboard so that you can study up. Sound good? Any other questions on the quiz retakes? Nope, just, just come. Show up and say, I want to do quiz five. I'll hand you quiz five. You do quiz five. Well, not quiz five, sorry. All the other quizzes. But you pick one. So probably you've, if, you did, if you got like a zero on one, that would be the one I would pick. OK. All right. Um, so that's quiz retakes. So I'm, yeah, I'm implementing that policy just because right now, the as it stands, the Grade distribution isn't isn't bad, but it's a little bit worse than I anticipated it being, and it's a little bit worse than um, the class has historically been when I've taught it before, and just historically from the data from the university. So I'm gonna make this slight correction here in the hopes that I won't need to um, do any curving on the final. But of course, if our distribution is still really really bad on the final, then I may or may not curve that, but I'm planning on using this to improve grades without having to implement a curve on the final. Okay? Does that sound fair to everybody? I think that's fair. Okay, so that's that. Any other um, administrative questions or comments or concerns? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and jump into material for today, which is gonna be fun, but let me really quickly reiterate what we talked about last time, which was just, we've been studying what these integrals are, and after learning what they are, we learned last time what they mean, right? So we learned that the, integral from a to b of a function is just going to be the area under that curve. And then we asked ourselves, what does that mean in the context of a problem? So say fu the function is representing something physical, like an, a, a quantity of a substance, or, or money, or profit, or bacteria, or whatever. And we want to understand what happens when I integrate the rate of change of that substance. Well, what it turns out I get is the total change in that quantity from 
t equals a to t equals b, okay? So we integrate the rate of change, we get the total change. And the units of this measurement, which remember when we integrate from a to b of a function, we're going to get a number, right? So this number has a meaning and it has units and its units are going to be just whatever the, the units of f of x are times the units of x. Or if you have f of t dt, then it's the units of f of t times the units of t, so on and so forth. So that was what we learned last time. And what we haven't really talked about yet is, say I want to know what this total change is. Then my goal is to understand what is this number. But how do I find out what that number is? And so far we said, well, we can approximate this number using Riemann sums, and that's about it. But today we're going to learn how we can actually find that number exactly. So before we move on to today's material, are there any questions of, about integrals and what we learned last time, which was units of integrals and interpreting, interpreting integrals? Yeah. No, 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 that's just a random, okay. sorry, yeah. Oh, why is it still there? It's weird. Okay. Yeah, that's just a mismarcation. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's jump into section 5.5. .5. So let's really quickly try to estimate these following values. We might as well do the warm up real quick. So one thing that we have learned is, okay, of course, when I write integral from 0 to 4 of f of x, or from a to b of f of x, what I'm going to refer to is what is the area which is above the curve, and then I'm going to subtract from that the area which is beneath the curve. So for the first one, we should start at 0 and go to 4. So if I start at 0 here, and I march along okay, until I get to what, what, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so I'm going to start counting area here, and I'm going to count area until I get to 4, and that's where I'm going to stop. So I want to know what is this number. Well, this number is going to be the area above the x-axis minus the area beneath. So it looks like all of the area I have is beneath. So how am I going to estimate this area? I'm just going to count boxes, okay? I'm just going to count boxes. It looks like I've got one, two, three, four, five, six whole boxes. And then maybe this one's a half a box. This one's another half of a box. Oops, not 5.5. It should be 6.5, right? 6.5, and then maybe up to 7. And then these two maybe together make 1, so I get 8, and then here's 8.8, .8. and then same on the other side. So I'm going to add 1 for these two, that gets me to 9.8, .8. and then add another 0.80% of a box, so I get like 10.6. So it looks like if I count up the boxes, between all of these I've got about 10 and a half full boxes. So I would say that the area above the x-axis is 0, and then I'm subtracting from that the area which is beneath the x-axis. Now the area beneath the x-axis, I just counted all those boxes, and I said it's roughly 10.6 boxes. Okay, so I would say the area that this integral is approximately equal to negative 10.6. Any questions on this first warm-up problem? Okay, how about the integral from 0 to 5? What's going to change with this one? Yeah, this time the area beneath is going to be the same, but we've, we've now got some positive area. So let's count the positive area. This box looks like it's, I don't know, 90% of a box. And maybe this one is 70% of a box, so together we get 1.6. And then this one looks like, I don't know, 40% of a box, so all together we have 2. And then this one looks like 0.2 of a box, so then we've got 
And then the last box looks like maybe just a tenth of a box. Who knows? 2.3. This is kind of subjective, as you can see. So if you got, you know, 2.5 or 2, no big deal. All right. So one thing that's useful, by the way, with, with counting boxes like this is sometimes it's easier if you find two boxes that look like they add up to one whole box, right? So if I took this box, by which I mean the area underneath the curve that's in this box, and then I took the area underneath the curve in this box, it kind of looks like it would add up to one whole box, right? See what I mean? So that's one way that you can make the counting easier. Okay, so it looks like I'm gonna have 2.3, that's the area above the x-axis, and I just subtract the area beneath the x-axis, which I already found out is 10.6. So I get 2.3 minus 10.6, which is a number, who knows. Okay, so, any questions on, yeah? Correct. Well, what I want to do is count the area above the x-axis and then count the area beneath the x-axis and subtract. So in the first one, it turned out we only went from 0 to 4. So I had 0 area in the top and I had 10.6 area in the bottom, which is why I subtracted 10.6 from 0. I'm going to do the same thing here, only this time I have some area above. So I'm going to take the area above, which is 2.3, and I'm going to subtract from that the area which is beneath the x-axis, which is 10.6. What do you mean keep the negative in front of the 10.6? The, the area beneath, area is always a positive number. So the difference between area and integration is some area we are going to take in a positive way and some area we're going to subtract, right? If you wanted to think about it in the way that I think you're thinking about it, it would be the following. You could split this up. You could say that this integral is the same as the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx plus the integral from 4 to 5 of f of x dx. That was one of the rules that we had. And if you want to do it that way, then you would get negative 10.6 plus whatever this integral is. This is just the area above the x-axis from 4 to 5. So then you'd get negative 10.6 plus 2.3. I think that might be what you're getting, um, uh, what you're thinking of here. Is that right? Yeah, so area is always positive, but there's a good check that you can do, by the way, any time that you're at the end of an integration here, is if you have a graph, just take a look. Does it look like there's more area beneath, or does it look like there's more area above? If it looks like there's more area beneath, then your total integral is going to be negative, right? And if it looks like there's more area above, then the integral will be positive, because the amount of area on top is bigger than the amount of area on bottom. If you take two numbers, one of them is bigger than the other, and you subtract the smaller from the larger, then we're going to get a positive number, right? Whereas if we take the smaller and we subtract the larger from it, then we'll get a negative number. Okay. So that, that was the warm-up problem. It's just a simple, um, well, it's not... I won't say that it's simple, but it is a counting boxes problem. And we just need to remember that the integral of a function is the area above minus the area beneath from our starting point to our ending point. So sometimes that starting point and ending point are going to switch around and be all over the place. So make sure you keep an eye out on those. OK, so now we are going to learn the fundamental theorem of calculus. So drum roll, please. If there, if f of x, okay, if capital F of x is a function, okay, so just any old function, and moreover, we know that function's derivative, okay, its derivative f prime of x is a continuous function. So remember, continuous means 
can be drawn without picking up our pencil. Right? Can be drawn without picking up our pencil. So the derivative is a function. And I know what, what the original parent function is. So I know a function and its derivative on an interval. Then what is going to be true? The integral from a to b of the derivative function, f prime of x, dx, is nothing but the parent function evaluated at b minus the parent function evaluated at a. OK, so what does this really mean? Okay, What it's saying is that the definite integral of the derivative of a function, okay, we integrate the derivative over an interval, and that tells us this theorem tells us that that integral is the same as just whatever is the total change of the original function over that interval. Right? The total change of that function over that interval. OK, so why is this interesting? This is interesting because this is telling us OK, if the function that we want to integrate is the derivative of a function, what, which I know what the function is, whose derivative is the function that I'm trying to integrate, then I can find out what this number is exactly simply by plugging in the bounds into the parent function and subtracting, which is kind of shocking. I mean, it is shocking. It's, fu it's fully shocking, actually, that this should be true. But it is true. And let's see what this means graphically. Okay, So I've written down a lot of words in a formula. Let's see what it means graphically. Okay, What it means graphically is if we have two functions here. So capital F of x is the parent function x squared, whose derivative, we all know the derivative of x squared is 2x, right, because of the power rule. So what it's saying is that if we integrate the derivative of this function, so if we do the integral from 0 to 3 of capital F prime of x, or, or just which is just 2x, right? Why don't I write 2x? If I do the integral from 0 to 3 of 2x dx, that tells me what this area is under this curve. And what this is telling us is that the, there is a relationship between the area underneath the derivative of a function and the change in height that the original function occurs, or that the original function undergoes over this interval. So the number 9 is manifesting in the top picture as the change in height. As I go from 0 to 3, the height of my function increases from 0 to 9, which is a net increase of 9 units. So the function increased by 9 units. Well, it's telling us that this is that this is this quantity is going to be equal to the area underneath the derivative of that function from 0 to 3. So this area of this triangle here is actually equal to the height of this green line segment. OK, so that's, that's shocking. I think it's shocking. So what is, why, why does this matter? Well, it matters because if, say, we are trying to find the area under a function which is really kind of a not very nice function. Right? Say we're trying to find the area underneath a function which is not a very nice function. Then what we can do is think about it not as finding the area of this function, but rather if we can find a function whose 
derivative is the function we want to integrate, then all we need to check is not the area underneath this bottom curve, but rather the change in height from one side to the other side of this other function. OK, so in calculus, we're always trying to take problems which are difficult and turn them into easier problems. The problem of finding the area underneath this curve is very difficult, because the only way we know how to do it right now is to approximate it using rectangles and then take like lots and lots and lots of rectangles, which is kind of a pain in the butt, unless you have a computer algorithm that you've already coded to do that. But that's also a pain in the butt, right? So what is this saying? Wouldn't you rather answer the question, what is the difference in height between these two points instead of what is the area underneath this curve? Well, for this one, it's a triangle, so it's easy. But if you have some other function, finding the difference in height between two points is easy. Finding the area underneath some wonky looking shape is difficult. So this is why the fundamental theorem of calculus is um, great, I'll say. OK, so let's just remind ourselves one more time of the definition. So if f of x is a continuous is a function and its derivative is continuous, then when we integrate the derivative, it's just equal to the difference in height of the original function at both of the endpoints. All right. So let's see how this manifests in some examples. So they tell us if the integral from 1 to 5 of f of x is dx is equal to 8. And they tell us what is the height of the original function. So presumably here, f prime of x. Oftentimes, we'll see the notation f prime of x is little f of x. So little f is the derivative, and capital F is, well, we'll know, come to know it today as the antiderivative of the little function. OK, so we integrate the derivative of this function. Well, I'm just going to apply my theorem. I know that this is little, this is f prime of x, and I'm doing the integral from a to b. So I know that the integral from 1 to 5 of f of x dx is equal to, by the theorem, f of b minus f of a, where in this case b is 5, so I do f of 5 minus f of 1. OK, and our goal here is to find out what is f of 5. Well, they tell us what f of 1 is, and they tell us what this integral is. So all I have to do is replace. So I get 8 is equal to capital F of 5 minus, I just replace f of 1 by what it's equal to, which is 2. And then I'm just going to add 2 to both sides, which tells me that capital F of 5 is going to be 10. OK, so basically three types of questions that I can ask you about the fundamental theorem of calculus. We have these three numbers which are related, right? We have the value of the antiderivative at 5, the value of the antiderivative at 1, and then the value of the integral. And the relationship says that the value of the integral is equal to the value of the antiderivative at the right endpoint minus the value of the antiderivative at the left endpoint. OK? So I could say tell you what any two of these are and ask you to find the third one. So I could tell you what the integral is, tell you what f of 1 is, ask you to find f of 5. Or I could not tell you what f of 1 is, but do tell you what f of 5 is. Or maybe I don't tell you what the integral is, and I just tell you what are f of 1 and f of 5, right? It's a situation where I could ask multiple questions about the same theorem, right? Yeah. So I thought that you said before that like the um, integral Mm -hmm. But now you're using the term antiderivative and integral as like two different things. So like, what what's what? Okay, so um, let me hold off on answering that question because we're going to talk about what exactly is an antiderivative okay. today in in a minute. But yeah, you're right. I shouldn't probably shouldn't throw out that term until I've actually defined what it is. But yes, in some sense, integration is the reverse of derivation. But when I say that. I'm not exactly referring to integration over a specific interval, right? When we talk about integration over a specific inter interval with bounds, we call this the definite integral. And 
what it returns is a number, right? So that number is not going to be the antiderivative of the function. It's the number that we get when we plug stuff in to the antiderivative of that function, which is a little bit different from a different type of integral we're going to talk about in a minute called the indefinite integral. But I promise, we're, we're getting there. Okay. You're, just, you're just way ahead of me today, OK? We're going to get there. So this is the theorem. Let's see a couple more examples here. OK, word problem time. All right. A turkey is put in the oven, and it's currently 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and we put it into an oven when time t is equal to 0. And the temperature of the turkey is rising at a rate of, at a rate of r of t per minute with t in minutes. We're supposed to estimate the turkey's temperature after 15 minutes. Okay, we're supposed to estimate the temperature after 15 minutes. So let's say that the, that, uh, what do we want to say? So R of T is the rate at which our temperature is changing, which means that capital R of T is the turkey's temperature. OK, capital R of t is the turkey temperature, right? Because r prime of t will be the rate at which the temperature is changing, which is our little r of t, which is our 2 times 1.03 to the t function. So now what I want to do is interpret this problem in the context of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says, the integral from a to b of the derivative of a function is equal to the total change of that function over the interval. So let's see if we can incorporate some of this information and just write down some of the things which we know based on this word problem. So let's start with the first statement. A turkey is 50 degrees Fahrenheit when we put it into the oven at time t equals 0. What is this telling me? How can I write down this statement mathematically? OK, but if I do 1.03 to the 0, what do I get? You get 1. And then if I do 2 times 1, I get 2. So 50 equals 2 doesn't seem like it's quite right. But you're on the right track, right? This has something to do with like the temperature of the turkey, right? But what is r, little r of t? It is the rate at which the turkey is heating up, right? But 50 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature of the turkey when t is equal to 0. How do I write down that statement mathematically? Close. Big R of, we know what t is, right? It's 0. So big R of 0 is 50, right? OK, now let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's figure out what they're asking us to find out. They want to know what is the turkey's temperature after 15 minutes. So the thing that I want to find, the question mark, can be written down mathematically as what? The turkey's temperature after 15 minutes. How do I write that down mathematically? Big R of 15. Yeah, big R of 15, right? OK, so I just want to go back really quickly to the fundamental theorem. What does this fundamental theorem relate? It relates the integral from a to b of the derivative of a function to the value of that function at the two endpoints. So for our purposes, we've found these two, right? The temperature, well, the temperature at the end is what we want to know. And then the temperature at the start is our 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So the last piece of puzzle is going to be this guy, right? So how can I write down the last piece of information which says 
the temperature of the turkey is rising at a rate of r of t equals 2.2 2 times 1.03 to the t degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Okay, how can I relate this derivative function to r of 0 and r of 15? So let's start with the equation, right? Using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that the integral from something to something of something is going to be equal to the value of the big function at the endpoints being subtracted. So that's going to be r of 15 minus r of 0. That's the cha total change in temperature. It's going to be equal to, if I have a function which is expressing a rate of change, how do I get the total change of that substance from A to B? Well, yeah, we, I mean, we could take a Riemann sum, but how would I get it exactly? How could I express it exactly? Yeah, integrate, right? So this substance, this number, is going to be equal to the integral from well, what time do I start and what time do I end? t equals 0 and then t equals 15 minutes, right? So I'm going from 0 to 15. And I'm accumulating change based on a rate of change function, which is given by this little r of t, which is the derivative of capital R. So here I'm going to put 2 times 1.03 to the t dt. Okay, so this is the relationship of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says, we know this is the total change in temperature from 0 to 15 minutes. And what does it say? It's equal to the temperature when we started being subtracted from the temperature when we ended. Okay, in that sense, it's very intuitive, right? Okay, but... What are we supposed to find? We're supposed to figure out what r of 15 is. So if we solve for r of 15, we just get the following. We just get it's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 15 of <coughs> 2 times 1.03 to the t dt plus r of 0, right? Which is just 50. Okay, so I can find out what the temperature is at the end as long as I know what this number is. Okay, what this number is. Which for now, the only way I know how to find out what this number is would be to use a Riemann sum. So I could do like a left Riemann sum with 15 rectangles and get pretty close to what this number is. Right, but today we're gonna learn how to actually find out what that number is exactly. But I'm going to leave this problem here for now because I don't want to spend more time doing Riemann sums today um, if we're just going to learn antiderivatives in a minute. So are there any questions on this problem, how I put this word problem in terms of the fundamental theorem of calculus? It takes a little bit of getting used to. Let's do a little bit of a group exercise here. Let's work on problem three for about five or 10 minutes in a group here and try to see if we can write some things down here. So we've got a graph which is giving the population of a town and we're supposed to estimate the total change in that population over a given time period. And then we're supposed to check if the population was a certain amount when we started how do we find out what the population is later? And this is all going to come down to our fundamental theorem of calculus. So go ahead and get into your groups. If you have some questions, raise your hand and I'll come over and help your group out.
shortly after what is integral of this function is and right? So in this case, we're not going to start at where we were at the end of the presentation. If you were going to start at a certain point and then start counting up, like how you're describing, right, then you would want to say that the function that you're looking at is describing the population. So let, let's come back together as a group.
So how, how, how did this problem go? Was your group able to come to an agreement? Okay, not so much agreement out there. Okay, well then, we should go through it together then. So let's just start with the first question. So it says we want to estimate the change, the total change in the population between 2000 and 2010. And what are we given? We are given a graph of what? The rate of change of that quantity. So what is the relationship between the rate of change of a quantity and the total change of that quantity over a subinterval? So if I have a rate of change, right, of a substance, how do I find the total change in that substance from t equals a to t equals b? Yeah, you integrate the rate of change. So if I'm after the total change, I know that the total change over an interval is equal to the integral of the rate of change over that interval. So I need to integrate the function f of t from the year 2000 to the year 2010. So how do you guys feel about doing the integral from 2000 to 2010 of f of t dt? What? Shania says no. Can someone else tell me why this is not a great uh, thing to do? Yeah, t here is in years since 1990. So 2000 is 10 years from 1990, and 2010 is 20 years from 1990. So I need to do the integral not from 2000 to 2010, but the integral from 10 to 20. OK, now how do I get this number? Count boxes. So I want, I want the boxes which are seen here. So I've got like 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe 5.2 or something like that. I've got like, yeah, like 5.2 boxes maybe, I would say. Okay, so that's my answer. I've estimated the total change in population from 2000 to 2010. It was 5.2 people, right? No, why is 5.2 people not a satisfactory answer? Yes, not only is f of t measured in thousands of people per year, but what does each box represent? Each box, if you look, it's two and a half units high and two and a half units wide. So one box is the area of one box is 2.5 units high, which that's 1,000 people per year. So that's 1,000 people per year. And I multiply that times the width of each box, which is five years, or not five years, two and a half years. So times 2.5 years. So the years cancel, and I end up with 6.25 thousand people. So if I have 5.2 boxes, and each box represents an increase in population of 6.25 thousand people, then I'm going to take the number of boxes times however much each box changes my population. So I get 5.2 times 6.25 thousand people. So whatever that number is. Any questions on part one of this? OK, so so far, this question is just about section 5.4. We, we have not brought in the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, right? All we've done is said, OK, what is the total change of the population from 2000 to 2010? The total change 
is what we get when we integrate a rate of change. Okay, so if I do that, this is what I get. Any questions on that? Yeah? I thought that that was like what the theorem was saying because we took the area under the derivative function. That's true. Yeah, so, okay, you could, you're right, you could phrase it as what we're really asking is what is this number, right? We're asking what is the difference in population. And what we say is the difference in population is going to be equal to the integral of the rate of change of the population. So yeah, it is kind of, it can be thought of as fundamental theorem. What I meant when I said that this is 5.4 is we learned in 5.4 that the integral of a rate of change over an interval gives us the total change. Which is just kind of like a, it's a specific part of the fundamental theorem, I guess, if you will. So yeah, you're right. It, it is basically the same. Okay, let's take a look at part B. Now this is a little more complicated. I want to find the, they tell us the population in 2010 was 9.25 thousand people. And I'm supposed to estimate the total population in 2020. Well. I'm just going to use my fundamental theorem of calculus here, right? What does the fundamental theorem of calculus say? It says that the integral from, well, I'm going from 2010 to 2020, so that means I'm integrating from 20 to 30, of little f of t dt is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to capital F of 30 minus capital F of 20. Now remember, little f of t describes the rate of change of capital F. So capital F is the population. And what am I asking? The question is, what is the total population in 2020? That is exactly described by F of 30. So using this theorem, I can just rearrange and I can isolate F of 30. I know it's going to be equal to just whatever F of 20 is plus the integral from 20 to 30 of f of t dt. And this is saying something very simple. It's saying the population in 2020 is going to be whatever the population was in 2010 plus what however many more people were born from 2010 to 2020. OK, so all I need to do is count boxes, right? 2010 was 9.25 thousand, so I get 9.25 thousand plus, and I'm going to repeat this same process of this integration, only I'm going to count the boxes now from 20 to 30. Okay, so I count this many boxes, multiply each box times 6.25 thousand people, add that number to 9.25 thousand, and I get my answer. Any questions on the second part of this example? OK, this covers basically two of the ways that I can ask questions about this. The third way that I could ask a question would be to say the following. I could say something kind of like part B, only I could tell you, well, if the population in 2020 was a certain amount, and I know that between 2010 and 2020, the population grew by a certain amount. I could ask you, what is the initial population, right? What was the population when we started? You know, if I end with 30 million and my population grew by 10 million, then when I started, the population was 20 million, right? That's, that's the last case that I have that's not in this problem. Any questions about the second part of this problem? Okay. Can you remind me how you came to or how you got 5.2? So the way I found 5.2 was by counting the number of boxes. So this looks like about four boxes here. And then to me it looks like these these two kind of add up to be like one box. So that's like five boxes total. And then I added on this looks like, I don't know, maybe a 0.2 of a box. 
So that so I estimated this looks like about 5.2 boxes to my eye. You might have gotten more like 5.1 or 5.5 or whatever. Does that make sense? So that was how I got the number of boxes. And then I had to multiply that times what is the population change of each box? Well, that's just the area of a box. The area of a box is is the base times the height. The height of the box is two and a half thousand people per year. And then the width of a box is 2.5 years. So I take those two numbers and I multiply them together. I cancel the years and I get 2.5 times 2.5 is 6.25. And then I, the years cancel, so I'm left with just 1,000 people as my units. OK. Let me check my, how much time I got. Um, really want to go yeah I do okay so okay we're gonna close our discussion here about the fundamental theorem of calculus for the time being um, and talk about something a little bit more specific right so so far what we've said is okay if we know what capital F of X is then I'm able to estimate, actually I'm able to find the exact number of what is the integral of the derivative of that function. Right? If I know what the original function f of x is, I can calculate the integral of its derivative. Right? Now we're going to ask a slightly different question. Where are my notes? Oh, this is chapter, okay, that's fine. Now we're going to ask a slightly different question. So I, I'm moving into 6.2 now. Yeah, we're going to come back to 5.6 and 6.1 later. Okay, so what I was saying was basically, okay, if we know what capital F of X is, we are able to do the integral of its derivative, right? But let's say that I just have a random function and I want to find its integral, but I don't know what the parent function capital F of X is. So let's just say I'm out in the wild and I come across a function and I'm like, huh, what is the area underneath that curve? But I don't know what is a function whose derivative is the function I want to integrate. Okay, And this is where the, the subject of antiderivatives is going to come in. So you don't need to write all of this down. But let's, let's start with a question for the class. If I start with a function whose derivative is 3, then my question is, am I able to come up with a function f of x whose derivative is 3? So what do we think for this one? Whose function, what function is, what is a function whose derivative is 3? A linear function with slope 3, right? So how about f of x equals 3x? OK, so this is what I mean, Christian, when I'm talking about doing an antiderivative. I, I want to think about, well, I know there's a relationship between the derivative of a function and its antiderivative. So when I'm doing integration, if I'm just having this function, I want to know what is the antiderivative so that I can plug in those values and use the fundamental theorem. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say we're going to do the reverse of a derivative. So we start with 3, and I say, what is a function whose derivative is 3? Well, how about 3x? Okay, seems perfectly logical. If I take the derivative of capital F, I get 3. But here's a moral quandary for you. 
What about the function capital F of x equals 3x plus 1? Its derivative is still 3. Okay, its derivative is still 3. Okay, so when we have a function and we want to say what is the antiderivative of that function, it's a little bit of a poorly worded question, right? Because I say find the antiderivative of this function and you tell me which one, right? Because I could do 3x, I could do 3x plus 1, I could do 3x plus 1,000, I could do 3x minus 1 million, or I could add any constant, right? Because when I take the derivative of this constant, it's just going to go away, right? It's just going to become zero. So I've lost some information in some sense about my previous function. Okay, so the, the take-home message of this section is going to be that if we want to do the integral from a to b of f of x dx, then it is enough to find n antiderivative of this function. So I just pick my favorite one, and then I am going to evaluate capital F of b minus capital F of a. Okay, So I just need to find an antiderivative of this function. So I find a function whose derivative is the function I want to integrate. And then, because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, all I have to do is find the change in height in that function from a to b. And that's how I get the area underneath a general curve. OK, so let's take a step back now and start this section by reviewing a couple derivatives here. OK, so nothing crazy here. We're going to find the following derivatives. This will be good practice for your final exam. OK, so how do I do the derivative of 5e to the 2x? What rules am I going to need to use to do that derivative? Chain rule, Chain rule or e to the kx rule. And also, constant multiple rule, right? The 5 is going to hang out. And then what I need to do is write down the derivative of e to the 2x, which is what? 2x. Just 2e to the 2x, right? Okay, so this came from the, if you want, the e to the kx rule, or you could say it's the chain rule, where the inside function is 2x, right? So the derivative would be whatever the derivative of e to the z is, where we keep 2x in there and then multiply times the derivative of 2x, which is 2. OK, so this is just to get us started thinking about, well, how am I going to go backwards, right? When I go the other way, what am I doing? Well, it's, we kind of want to think about, well, what, it, what happens each time I do a derivative of this guy? What's happening, really, functionally speaking, is I'm picking up an extra multiple of 2, and the function's staying the same otherwise. So you might surmise that to go in the reverse direction, I should do the opposite of this, right? I should, instead of multiplying by 2, maybe I should divide by 2. OK, how about this one? g of x equals ln of 7x plus 1. What rules do I need? I need the rule of ln and chain rule, right? So this derivative is going to be just 1 divided by the inside function, 7x plus 1. And I multiply that by the derivative of the inside function, which is just 7. OK. So this is getting us started in thinking about, well, how would, I, how would I find the area under a curve like this? Well, it's going to have something to do with a function which looks like that, right? OK, one last one. How do I do this derivative? Quotient rule? No. I could do quotient rule. That's fine. But it's probably easier to think of this as 2 times 2x minus 1 to the negative 1 power and use the chain rule. If I do it that way, the 2 is going to hang out. And then this is chain rule. So I just leave the inside alone, and I do the derivative of the outer function. So the power becomes 1 less. and it should, of course, be multiplied by, in front, 
by the old power, which was negative 1. So I get negative 1 times that function to the negative 2. And now I have to multiply times the inside derivative, which is 2. So I get negative 4 over 2x minus 1 all squared. OK, so this is just to refresh our, our memory about derivatives and how we do some of these derivatives, right? Because in the end, what we're interested in doing is an antiderivative. So we need to understand how are we going to reverse engineer these processes. OK, so let's have a definition for antiderivatives. An antiderivative, capital F of x of little f of x is any function such that its derivative is little f of x. So let's do an example. If f of x equals 1 over x, what is a function capital F of x such that its derivative is 1 over x. The natural log function, right? The natural log function is a function whose derivative is 1 over x. OK, so this is what an antiderivative is. So you can imagine how this is going to fit in to the fundamental theorem of calculus. I know that this integral is equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A. Computing the integral is really hard, but plugging two numbers into a function is really easy. So I would much rather just plug into this antiderivative function. The only thing that is annoying me is, what the hell is that thing? How do I know what the function is that I'm supposed to plug into? And that's going to be what we are going to continue to study for like the next, well, the rest of the class, essentially. OK. So one major caveat about antiderivatives okay, is that antiderivatives are not unique. When we say unique, if something is unique, there's only one of it, right? So why do I say antiderivatives are not unique? Yeah, I could have multiple antiderivatives. What's another antiderivative of 1 over x? Yeah, 1 over x plus 1, or 1 over x plus a billion, or whatever number I want. I can just add it on. When I take its derivative, that number's just going to go away, right? OK. The reason that, that, that that's true, by the way, is what does f of x describe? It describes the rate of change of this function. If I add a number to this function, the only thing it does is it moves the function up or down. It doesn't change how that function is changing at a given point, i.e. the tangent line is going to be the same even if I move the whole function up and, up and down. Okay? It's not changing the way that this function is, uh, the slope of this function. It's just moving it up and down. OK, so last thing I want to mention, Now, why don't I save the rest for next time? But I'm going to mention, we're going to go through this quick problem here. And we are going to evaluate whether or not these functions which are given are an antiderivative of the function which we see. OK? So that's simple enough to check. What do I need to check? If I want to know, is 120x cubed an antiderivative of this function, how do I check that? Yeah, I can take the derivative of capital F and see if I get little f. So let's try. Capital F prime of x, what do I do? I take the 3 down, 
I get 3 times 120 times x squared, right? Which is, what, 360x squared. So what do we think? Is capital F of x an antiderivative of little f of x? No. In fact, capital F of x is a derivative of little f of x, right? So it's, it's going the wrong way. All right, let's try g of x equals 6x to the fifth. Well, I'm just going to check what its derivative is. It's 30x to the fourth, right? And hey, check it out. That matches with our function. Now, I know that this is an antiderivative of this function, and I know that all of the other antiderivatives, all the other ones, will be whatever that function is, 30x to the fourth plus a constant, right? Or 30, not 30x to the fourth, will be um, 6x to the fifth plus a constant, right? That's how all the other antiderivatives will look. So what do we think about 30x to the fifth based on this information? Could it also be an antiderivative? No, we would want to look for something like 6x to the fifth plus 21, right? That could be an antiderivative of our function. OK? All right, so next time we are going to discuss something called the indefinite integral of a function. OK, so we have the definite integral already. So what is the indefinite integral? And then we are going to learn a whole bunch of rules. So just like we had our derivative rules, they've all got their reverse. OK, and that's what we're going to talk about next time. Don't forget there's office hours today from 3 to 4.30.